You know what's the only thing dumber than proposing a brand new form of super fast transport that was actually proposed over a hundred years ago? Oh, I know. Thinking, thinking, thinking. I know. Got it. Let's run it under the Atlantic Ocean. So someone sent me this on Twitter. What if we dug tunnels between continents? Shorts. Wow. Four million or so hits in a week and a 95% approval rating. Not bad for something that is the metaphorical equivalent of saying, what if we built vertical takeoff and landing hypersonic solar battery powered hover cars that generate more energy than they produce and automatically convert into robo hover taxis when they're not in use and smell of strawberries. It would be like we could travel anywhere in the world in 15 minutes and the more we use them, the better it would be for the planet. Plus, they kind of smell nice. So this video quickly veers off from what would happen if we dug tunnels between continents. Here's what would happen if we dug tunnels between continents. Avoiding all the water and digging through the ground from England all the way to America would take an incredibly long time. Uh, no. This is like saying, why don't we build a bridge to the sun such that we can put all our solar panels there and they'll be much more efficient. And then coming up with the reason why we shouldn't do it is it would take a really long time. The idea of a tunnel under the Atlantic for transport is done on about 50 levels. Like say for instance, there is a large tectonic fault that goes down the middle of the Atlantic. One that's spreading at a rate of about two centimeters per year. Oh, and it's under about 10 kilometers of water. That's more or less enough to drown Mount Everest. You know, minor, technical problems. Yeah, good luck mending the leaks if something goes wrong down there. Actually, I should stress here that I'm just using 10 kilometers as a nice, easy ballpark number. That's the Atlantic at its deepest. The typical depth of the ocean floor in the Atlantic is about five kilometers. So first of all, let's take a look at what are the problems of working under that sort of depth of water. You see, there's a problem for people with breathing under pressure. For humans, the difference between the pressure on the outside of your body and the pressure in your lungs has to be within a fraction of an atmosphere, a fraction of a bar. Now that's not a problem when the pressure on the outside and the pressure in your lungs is provided by the same gas. But what if the pressure on the outside of your body is provided by water and the pressure on the inside is provided by the gas you breathe? Well, for a first approximation, your lungs are kind of like a carrier bag in that they can open and expel gas fairly quickly, but they're not very strong. And if the gas pressure on the outside is greater than the gas pressure on the inside, then you simply can't push air into them. Meanwhile, if the pressure on the inside is greater than the pressure on the outside, then your body just inflates like a balloon. And to give you an idea of what this might be like, let's call your lungs a basketball. How much pressure would you need in your lungs before they're comparably hard to compress as a basketball? And the answer is about half an atmosphere of extra pressure. So with that in mind, how much pressure does water add? Well, about one atmosphere of pressure is worth about 10 meters of water. So if you go down 10 meters in the water, you will have an extra atmosphere pushing on the outside of your body. So if you want to be able to breathe at that sort of depth, you need to breathe gas at two atmospheres of pressure. And if you're down at about 100 meters, you need about 10 bar of pressure. If I get a regular polyethylene terephthalate pop bottle and fill it up to about 10 bar, this is what it looks like. That's the pressure in your lungs at 100 meters. But if I were to take that, that pop bottle with 10 atmospheres of pressure in it down to 100 meters in depth, it would feel like a regular pop bottle. But if I bring it to the surface, different story. But there's a problem that if you go down even lower than that, eventually the viscosity of the gas becomes a problem. It becomes soupy and hard to breathe. To give you an idea of this viscosity, parachutes basically work on the viscosity of air. So at one atmosphere of pressure, this is the sort of parachute you need to send someone safely to the ground. 
However, if you go to Venus, where the atmospheric pressure is about 100 times that that it is on Earth, about 100 bar, that lip there constitutes the parachute that you need to descend this safely to the ground. In fact, to a reasonable approximation, 1,000 atmospheres of gas pressure is roughly about the viscosity of a liquid. So if you're breathing gas at 1,000 atmospheres, it's about as hard as breathing liquid. So at 100 bar, you have about a tenth of the viscosity of water. So for humans, they struggle breathing at about 50 atmospheres. That's basically where you get the deep saturation divers who have to go weeks of decompression just to get out. And with one atmosphere being worth about 10 meters of water, this works out to a depth of about 500 meters. And the depth of the Atlantic on average was about five kilometers, but I'm just gonna call it 10 for the moment so I can put Everest on there for scale. So basically the only way to get down to those sorts of depths is to take a subhull, which takes the majority of the pressure, you know, down from say uh, 50 atmospheres on the outside to one atmosphere on the inside. Now with all these deep sea subs, you'll notice something fairly generic about them, that the actual bit where the humans go in, the bit that takes the pressure is basically a sphere because it's the only thing that can take those sorts of pressures. So this is the sub that has the record for going the deepest, and it's called the Trieste. And that's the bit where the people go. Yeah, that's the size of the window that they had. And this is the US Navy version of it called Alvin, which will only go down to a, a very modest five kilometers. Incidentally, if you're wondering what happens if you do get a leak in this, there are some fairly graphic descriptions about what would likely happen to you in the event of a leak, mostly in terms of where it describes how you won't drown because the water will be coming in with such force that it'll shred you long before you have a chance to drown. Maybe the closest analogy you can get is eh, pressure washers, typically run at about um, 100 atmospheres. Yeah, get this, based on the latest data, it is estimated that pressure washers send more than 6,000 people every year to emergency rooms. Ben Skydale knows all too well the dangers of pressure washers. He got a deep cut in his hand that required seven stitches. This is merely the equivalent of being one kilometer down. It gets 10 times stronger than this by the time you're on the floor of the Atlantic. Yeah, there's a very good reason why we don't do engineering projects on the floor of the Atlantic, let alone under it, where the slightest of leaks and the entire project would be a write-off. Oh, and plus the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is about two kilometers high. But wait, if you think this is stupid so far, we ain't even got started yet. Instead, you could make one massively long 5,500 kilometer tube and place it over the ocean. Now they want to float the tube all the way across the Atlantic. Then using anchors, you drag the tube down about 45 meters and secure the tube using wires tied to the ocean's floor. Now what did they say? Anchor it to the ocean floor. The ocean floor that is about five kilometers beneath them. You see, there's a principal problem with that, and that's the cables, once they get beyond a certain length, just tend to snap, which is what limits how high you can make elevator cables. And yes, this is why space elevators crash and burn before they even leave the ground. Now, thankfully, once you get into the seawater, you can offset this somewhat by adding buoyancy aids to your cable. So now you'll need lots of flotation devices on each of those cables. And if they get overgrown or eaten by sea life, well, then the cables just snap under their own weight. But this is still small potatoes, because the oceans have currents. Oceans are actually pretty dynamic systems, which can quite happily get currents up to a few knots. Yeah, give or take a, a few miles per hour or a few kilometers per hour. So for instance, the Gulf Stream there typically flows at about eh, four miles per hour, six kilometers per hour, that sort of thing. Which might not sound much and doesn't bother you much if you're floating in a boat. But if you're stretching a tube all the way across the Atlantic, that is a very serious problem. You see, ballpark figures, the density of air is about 1,000 times less than the density of water. So it turns out, ballpark figures, that about a one kilometer per hour water current is worth about the same as a 1,000 kilometer per hour air current, a wind, which, which is basically a supersonic wind. Now, most of the time, of course, you don't notice this because most ships drift with these currents. 
but that's not something that this tube would do. So you've got to take all of that force to stop the ocean currents and keep this thing straight with 10 kilometer cables tied to the ocean floor. To travel through your tube quickly, you'd need to use vac trains. This will allow a train to travel at incredibly high speeds due to there being little to no air resistance. That can travel at 2,000 kilometers per hour, because why not? Not only that, but our train would also be levitating using high-powered magnets. You'd be going about 2,000 kilometers an hour, which is almost double the speed of sound. Oh, and I might not have mentioned that for things to travel at that sort of speed, the tracks would need to be super straight and super level. And this tube is going to be anchored by 10 kilometers very stretchy cable. It's probably worth mentioning at this point that ships can't actually anchor in the deep ocean because just the length of the anchor chain alone would fill up a cargo ship. You'd be going about 2,000 kilometers an hour, which is almost double the speed of sound. And it's probably also worth mentioning that there's already been a method of traveling between the US and Europe at about two times the speed of sound. Concorde. And it didn't require massive infrastructure on the sea floor under five kilometers of water in which a single breach would instantly kill everyone in it why why did the concord become a museum exhibit how did a breakthrough become a piece of memorabilia oh and concord was decommissioned because it wasn't economical they don't exist unless they make money some people don't like that idea but it's a fact of life and if they're making a product that doesn't make them money um they'll either stop making it or they'll go out of business or both yeah just imagine if the laws of physics weren't a thing in determining if something was economically viable or not just imagine all the remarkable things we could achieve and that's today's video of trying to throw a bucket of cold reality water on the disinformation merchants and fabulous such that we might get a little smidgen of scientific literacy in the viral video section and if you like that as an idea drop a thumbs up on it and maybe consider supporting this channel on patreon sorry i've been away for a couple of weeks doing sciencey stuff you can catch up with that on my other voice of thunder channel and as ever thanks for watching